Maybe more of your family can get saved. Maybe their family would come in and get right. Amen? Naomi's future looked like it was gone in Moab, but when she came home, Boaz gave her what she had lost. She had got her joy back, her peace back, her security back. Money can't buy those things. But she got them back because she came home. Are you Naomi? Is there a Naomi in here? You left the house of bread and praise years ago, maybe? Only to find yourself in a mess in Moab? Let me ask you, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting on? What is keeping you in Moab? What's keeping you there? Now for the next two, I'm going to go quickly through them so I can get to the last two. I'm very aware of the time. So number three is in 2 Timothy. Turn real quickly to 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy, <coughs> in, in 2 Timothy, you're going to find the weary servant. The weary servant. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul was a saved man. Paul served the Lord faithfully. Paul never left the Lord. Paul never quit on the church. Paul was faithful until the day he died. He was faithful. But Paul knew this is not his home. Paul knew they were just pilgrims passing through. That one day we were going home. Jesus said, I go prepare a place for you, and if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. Basically what he says there in first, excuse me, in John 14. But listen, Paul said, I'm ready. I'm right with the Lord, and I'm ready to go. Look at this in verse 7. 2 Timothy 4, 7. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love His appearing. Paul said, I'm ready, and I'm right with God, ready to go home. In verse 7, you see Paul's fight. You see Paul's finish. And you see Paul's faith. Then in verse 8, you see Paul's future. What a blessing. Paul was ready to go. You know what Paul did while he was here? He preached the gospel. Yes. He preached the gospel. God used him to, to reveal the gospel. What's the gospel? The death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, he said, For I deliver unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died, yes. according to the Scriptures, was buried according to the Scriptures, and rose again. That's the gospel. So Paul preached the gospel. He praised God. And he prepared the Gentiles. Amen. That's what Paul did. Yeah. Number four. Turn back just a little bit to uh, 2 Thessalonians. Make that 1 Thessalonians. I don't know why I said 2 First 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 4. And then you're going to see another homecoming. This one is the waiting saints. The waiting saints. Maybe you're here and you're like Paul. Maybe you're right with God and ready to go home. Maybe you have never uh, fell out. You're not a prodigal son. You're faithful, but you're tired. You're tired. This world's starting to wear on you and you're, you're saying, where is the Lord? I'm ready to go. Well, I tell you, 1 Thessalonians 4 ought to reassure you. It ought to comfort you. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4 and look at verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye saw or not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with Him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of our archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ 
shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. One day, the waiting saints won't have to wait anymore. I'm kind of like you. I'm tired. I'm ready for the Lord to come back. I, I'm tired of watching. I'm tired of watching young people grow up and get their license and get a job and then get pulled out into the world. I'm tired of watching homes get destroyed because they don't put the importance on the Word of God and family altar and prayer and home and church attendance don't mean anything to them. They, they're so busy chasing the almighty dollar to pay a bill because they bought something that they didn't need. That's more important than God and His blessings on their life anymore. It breaks my heart. It breaks my heart and I say, Lord, won't you just come? Any day now the Lord can step out on the cloud and call His children home. Any day He can step out. Today could be the last day for us here on earth. What a blessing. What a blessing. I don't even have to eat dinner. He can come right now and I'll be ready to go. You'll hear somebody shouting, it'll be me. Glory! It's about time! I've been looking for this for years! Glad you made it! Amen. 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 Boy, it'd be good. It'd be good. It'd be good. Listen, the, the waiting saints, there'll be no sign, just the rapture. There'll be no sacrifices to make, just the rapture. There'll be no sadness or sickness, just the rapture. That's what I'm looking for, just the rapture, those waiting saints. Now, for time's sake, I've got to hurry. Turn to Luke 16. Luke 16. We're going to find the last two in Luke 16. The last two homecomings in Luke 16. We're going to see the wicked sinner. And we're going to see the willingly saved. First of all, let's look at that wicked sinner. In Luke 16, verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fair sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried and in hell lift up his eyes being in torment. And seeing Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom, he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now is he comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot neither can they pass to us that would come from thence then he said I pray thee therefore father that thou wouldest send him to my father's house for I have five brethren that he may testify unto them lest they also come to this place of torment Abraham said to him they have Moses and the prophets let them hear them and he said nay father Abraham but if one went unto them from the dead, they would repent. And he said to him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Right. Here, we're talking about a wicked sinner's homecoming. They've got a homecoming too. When we go home, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We'll see our loved ones. We'll be united with them. We'll be in glory for all eternity. But the lost person, they've got a homecoming. But it's not a celebration. It's a burning. And you're the one burning. Look at what it says here. First, the person in the story. A certain rich man there in verse 19 could be any of us. Any of us. You say, well, preacher, I'm not rich. Yes, you are. If you own a car, you're, you're, you're in the top 5% of the world. If you own a car, most of us in America own more than one. 
We're blessed. We're blessed and spoilt, and we think we have nothing, and we're filthy rich. We enjoy air conditioning. We enjoy all kinds of food. We can go out and eat. We don't have to raise our own. We can just flip a switch if we want heat or flip a switch if we want air. We're rich! And we have no need of God. And that's the problem. No need of God. We've got so much, we don't have to depend on God. Today, people depend on their money, their position, their power their wealth, their works. None of that can save you. Jesus said, no man coming to the Father but by me. Money will not get you in front of God. The only way to be saved is through Jesus Christ. The place that was specified, just like saved people go to heaven, lost people go to hell. Hell's a real place. Hell is a place of torment. That brings us to the pain that is suffered. In, in verse 23, it's called torment. In verse 24, he talks about the he, he, he talks about the flames that are found there. The lost in eternity will suffer in those flames forever. There'll be no water, just weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. There'll be no help. There'll be no hope. Someone once said, "Hell would not be hell if hope ever." entered there. Do you understand what it means to be totally hopeless? No, no. We don't. Because as long as we've got breath in our body, we have hope. Amen. But when you die and you find yourself in hell, there will be no hope. No chance. No God on the throne showing mercy anymore. It's a God that is that is sentenced you to burn forever and ever. You say, what do you mean sentenced me to burn forever and ever? You chose to reject His plan of salvation. Therefore, your sentence is the lake of fire in the end. Amen. Now watch. Now watch. There'll be no second chance. People today have this crazy idea that they're going to go to hell and they're going to die and there's going to be one general judgment, one general resurrection. You're going to stand there and say, well, I wasn't as bad as he was, or I didn't do what she did, so if they're going to heaven, if they deserve heaven, then I deserve it because I didn't lie, cheat, and steal. I didn't cheat on my husband like her, like, like he did or she did, and I didn't do that, and I didn't smoke, and I didn't do this, and I didn't... I'm good! Hey, I used to party with them that went to church down there, and if they're going to heaven, I ought to go to heaven. People really believe that. Like your works saves you. Your goodness saves you. No, it don't. You're born lost because Adam disobeyed God. They partook of the fruit and they we were born in His fallen image. We're born sinners. And we're going to die a sinner unless somebody saves us. And God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He gave us a way to be saved. His Son came and walked a perfect life for us, shed His blood, died on a cross, and if we'll put our faith in that, He'll save us. Amen. Other than that, you have no hope. No hope. Church membership will not save you. Being baptized will not save you. Being confirmed will not save you. Only putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ will save you. Now the willingly saved. I could say something about him pleading for souls, but I, I, I'm out of time. I, I may in a minute. But the willingly saved. That's Lazarus. And the reason I say willingly saved, he's called a beggar. He was begging for crumbs because he was hungry. If he knew he was lost, he'd be begging God for help. So I believe he was a willingly saved man. If you get saved, it'll be your will. God's not willing that any should perish, but He'll let you die lost. Because it's your choice. So you have to be willing to get saved. You choose whether or not you go to hell. And some of you may be making the wrong choice. I'll do it later. Wrong choice. 
There may not be a later. Well, I, I ain't been that bad preacher, so I, I'll take my chances. Wrong choice. Wrong choice. Wrong choice. The person in the story may have been poor, but he was pardoned. He may have been a sick man, but he was saved. He may have been nasty to this world, but he had a new birth. What a blessing. What a blessing. He was dirty but delivered. What a blessing. That just shows you that all the money and position and power this world craves don't save you. Don't save you at all. He went to Abraham's bosom, a picture of heaven. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord for us today. It was a place that was full of peace and sweet rest. No more sickness, no more pain, no more disease. Just there with his Savior, reunited with loved ones that had gone on before. The plan was supplied there in verse 31. And he said to him, if they hear not Moses, there's the first five books, and the prophets, there's some more of the Bible, neither will they be persuaded though one rose from the dead. He said if God would, to open, would be to open up hell, Say, preacher, I believe that. If, if there's a big hole opened up right here in front of the in front of the pulpit, and you could smell the smoke, the sulfur coming out, and you could feel the heat, you could hear the roar of the fire and the screams of the damned. Oh, I believe, preacher. If I saw that, I believe. No, you wouldn't. The Bible says if you don't believe that book, you wouldn't believe that. You would think it was some trick. You think it was some? So you think it was some David Copperfield thing or something? You wouldn't believe it because if you really believed there was a hell, you'll believe it because of this book. Uh, that, that man said, "Please, please, Abraham, send somebody to tell my brothers." You know this. Now I'm going to give you something to think about. If you're here and you're lost, chances are. Someone in your family was lost before you. Because usually if you're here and you're saved, it's because your mom and dad was saved and they went to church and they brought you to church. You heard the gospel and you followed suit and you got saved and it just keeps going. I wasn't like that. My family didn't go to church. Had I died lost, chances are my mom and dad would have died lost. I was the first one in the family to get saved. I remember when she got her heart right. I remember that night. I remember that phone call. I remember getting excited. But anyway, anyway, chances are his brothers is going to hell. And he was saying, he was saying, I'm trying, I, I, I'm trying to see how I can skip some of this and keep going. He, he, he was saying, he was saying, please send somebody, please send somebody, because I don't want them to come to this place. So what I was trying to get at, if you're here lost, there's people in hell praying for you. Chances are you've got a loved one who died lost, and when they hit those flames, they thought, oh Lord, what have I done? They realize it's too late for them and they're crying out for you. There's people in heaven praying that you'd get saved. There's people here on earth praying that you'd get your heart right. But listen, according to that text you just read, there's people in hell praying that nobody comes to that place. That's a bad place. But you know, you're born headed there. It's not your fault. But you're born headed there. Adam and Eve sin, and we all born in that likeness. Preacher, I don't like being called a sinner. You're a sinner. You're a sinner and I can prove it. You said, you can't prove anything, preacher. How many of you have ever told a lie? If you didn't raise your hand, you lied. How many of you have ever lusted? How many of you have ever coveted something that wasn't yours? There's a bunch of sinners in here. I'm going to keep on the pulpit. But my back pocket, make sure my water. <laughs> make sure I got my water around this crowd. Bunch of sinners. But you know what he told them? He told them, said, listen, God had a plan. God had a plan. And that plan's written in the book. 
And it's as easy as A, B, C. Admit you're a sinner. You realize you're a sinner now, don't you? B means believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you believe Jesus lived a perfect life? Do you believe He was sinless? Do you believe He died to pay for your sins? Admit, believe, and see, call on Him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call on the only one that can save you. You're not calling on the church. You're not calling the Pope. You're not calling some denomination. You're not calling up anyone but the Lord Jesus Christ. The mediator between God and man. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes as they uh, come in.